Okay, so maybe let's get started. Uh, my name is Denis Slesky. I'm professor of Philosophy in Montreal, uh, and uh, I welcome you to the RTMP seminar series. And today is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Professor Alexander Krasnok. So let me just go over his bio really briefly. So uh, Alex obtained his PhD at Ipmo University in 2013, that's uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. After spending two years as a research scientist at the University of Texas in Austin and three years at City uh, University uh, in New York, um, Advanced Science Research Center as a research assistant professor and founding director of Platonic Core Facility, he joined Florida International University in 2021. So right in the middle of the phase of the pandemic as a tenure track assistant professor. So uh, Alex has a number of uh, uh, interest in, in research and, and uh, we, we had pleasure to discuss uh, some of those um, last night. Uh, he has authored uh, four of five books and book chapters, four patents, more than 150 papers. He earned several research awards, including the gold medal of Nobel laureate uh, Jordan Salvatore Foundation in 2016 and early career award in nanophotonics in 2021. Um, Alex, the topic of today is anomalies of light scattering. The floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Is the pointer working? Yeah, the pointer works. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Denise, for a very kind invitation and uh, kind introduction. Uh, can you please dim the light just a little bit to tell people to see the screen? All right. Uh, yeah. So my name is Alex Krasnok, and uh, I am assistant professor at Florida International University. And the title of my today's presentation is Anomalies of Light Scattering. <clears throat> so yes, I, as Denise just said, uh, I joined FIU, Florida International, uh, basically last year. And I'm really happy with this decision. Uh, this is a very young new university established just 50 years ago. We recently uh, celebrated the uh, anniversary of establishing this uh, good place. Uh, I, my personal thinking that the university is really good and uh, um, it has a like one of the most beautiful campuses I ever saw in my life. The campus supported, like used to be an airport, is a huge area, and then they decided to transfer the airport to another part of the of Miami. Yeah, the university is located in the center of Miami. And uh, yeah, they established this nice university. So today, FIU is among of the top research universities in US. And uh, I heard this is the largest university now in the South uh, Florida in terms of uh, funding for, for research. And uh, yeah, pretty good place. And uh, yeah, a lot of sunshine, right? So very good place to do photonics because a lot of light. Uh, here is the uh, uh, basically uh, print screen of my, uh, my lab. It's called QTM, uh, Quantum Technology and Metamaterials. And we're doing uh, research in uh, several areas, including quantum materials, functional with the devices, quantum and optical sensors, and others. And uh, so today I will talk about uh, one of these areas, which is called anomalies in light scattering. Um, yeah, and by the way, I decided to change the switch the, the topic, the subject. Uh, basically, Denise recommended me uh, based on the uh, audience. Very good. So before talking about anomalies in light scattering, let's uh, first discuss the applications of conventional photonics, basically why we need con uh, photonics, right? Uh, so by this uh, few slides, I'm going to motivate myself to doing photonics. Uh, so the uh, very first and uh, Chrestomatic uh, uh, example of for application of photonics, of course, is the uh, optical fibers like 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 this one. So the optical fibers are basically glass tubes, right? And uh, you can excite optical modes by traveling along these tubes, 
to a very long distances. This is the most energy effective way to transfer information. Um, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just trying to make it full screen for you. Yeah, um, I mean, you okay? That's, yeah, that's good. So, and uh, today we use these optical fibers for uh, communications, interconnections between the countries, right? During this COVID crisis, I guess this is one of the most important technologies because we all could work remotely from home. We could connect with our families, friends across the, the globe. So uh, one of the most important technologies ever, I would say. But this technology has a very nasty uh, bottleneck, drawback. Uh, uh, because of the, so when the information comes to the data center, right, in form of optical pulses, we still have to transfer this optical pulses into pulses of electronics, right, the electrical pulse. And this transition from optics to electronics is very energy consuming, inefficient, and very, very slow. So the uh, current like goal today is to create optical, uh, like optical um, computers, systems that could work with information in all optical way. Yeah, and here I put this quote from recent DOE, US DOE uh, report saying that one typical data center consumes the energy that is enough to power basically a small town in the US. So yeah, very um, energy inefficient way. So, <clears throat> but today the state of the art, I guess, uh, is represented by this paper published like a few years ago in Nature, so this is a so-called hybrid system composed of electronic components boosted with optical optical components like 850 photonic components, waveguides, resonators, modulators. So all these optical components <clears throat> bring to the system in order to improve the functionality of, of the electronics here. So we currently believe that the next generation of our computers will be actually hybrid. Another technology where we're using photonics today, of course, artificial intelligence. And uh, so today, this is a really hot topic. People understood that you can realize a very efficient artificial intelligent networks using photonic, uh, basically, integra integration, integrated photonics, like shown here. Um, Another technology that is currently very, very developing is this LiDAR, right? It's like a radar, but we're using light uh, for measuring distances. The, like if you have a LiDAR in a, like a vehicle, this LiDAR system helps us to navigate in a crowded city, etc. And recently this LiDAR technology uh, made, made a revolution in archeology. span so today, archaeologists uh, use these drones with a LiDAR, and uh, this way, these scientists could uh, basically observe the uh, NSM like areas, towns that we lost thousands of years ago. This picture from South Africa, I saw, I guess. So you couldn't even see this uh, this town uh, this town uh, like by naked eye, but you can still detect this with the lidar. And of course, quantum computers and quantum communications. This also uses a lot of photonics, and uh, uh, this is also where conventional photonics is used, right? But recent development in light scattering theory has enabled a novel a, a number of novel. Uh, uh, scattering effects that we call anomalies in light scattering. And uh, I, guess, I guess the best way to convey this point to discuss uh, how these uh, anomalies in light scattering work, right, uh, is the uh, approach of scattering methods. So here on this picture, you see the general optical system, uh, right? It gets several ports, first port, second, third, etc. Um, 
And uh, these red arrows show the light that comes to the system, the signals at system force, right? And the blue arrows demonstrate the energy, the light that comes out from, uh, from the system. And uh, what the scattering system does, it basically connects the links, the inputs and outputs in all, all ports of the system. Like S11 connects the scattering to the same port, S12 uh, describes the trans, uh, transmission from port one to second port, etc. And uh, so the main point here uh, is that uh, scattering matrix is a complex valued function. You can, for example, take a determinant of this matrix and then plot the determinant of S matrix in the complex frequency plane. So on this feature here, this uh, axis X is the real frequency, the fre frequency that we used to, right? When we describe light, we say that a red light, for example, gets the frequency 500 terahertz. So this frequency belongs to this real frequency. And at the same time, we have the uh, plane, entire plane of imaginary frequencies. And uh, what this imaginary part of frequency does? So basically, if you if you take the can, the the time dependence of, a, of for example electric field in this way, you assume that your uh, frequency here it gets real part and imaginary part. You put this real real and imaginary part of this formula, and you get this um, conventional part, which is simple monochromatic wave, right? And uh, and this multiplication factor, which either grows exponentially or decays exponentially depending on the sign of the imaginary part of frequency. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that please don't hesitate to ask any questions during the presentation. Um, so the main point here is that if you plot this uh, scattering matrix in the complex frequency plane, you will observe several point like peculiarities there, which are poles in the lower complex plane and zeros in the upper complex plane. So zero of the scattering matrix uh, corresponds to the situation when I excite my optical system, but nothing comes out. So it either stored there or gets absorbed within, within the system. And the pole uh, corresponds to the eigen mode of, of the optical system. And uh, and if I design, basically the point is that I can design my system, add loss and gain to the system. This way, I can uh, change the position of poles and zeros and manipulate them. I can bring other poles, more zeros, and uh, manipulating these poles and zeros, I can engineer anomalies and light scattering. And here is, by the way, the paper, uh, a review paper published a couple of years ago with exactly the same name, anomalies and light scattering. <clears throat> so for example, if you consider a simple example of a public resonator, which is basically, uh, for example, a dielectric like glass uh, uh, resonator uh, slab, uh, this, this is the two-port system, right? You can excite this resonator from the left, you can excite it from the right, and uh, you can you have corresponding transmission from left to right, in, from, light to, from right to left, and corresponding reflections. So uh, you can combine all these transmissions and reflections into a matrix, which is a scattering matrix so now. And for this symmetric system, uh, this, the uh, reflection coefficient is the same from the left, from the right, and transmission is also the same by due to reciprocity. And then you find the determinant of this matrix, you plot this matrix in the complex plane, and you will observe these uh, zeros in the upper complex plane. And if you continue this to the lower complex plane, you will observe the corresponding poles uh, in the lower complex plane. So this is how, how it works in, like, in calculations, right? So let's start discussing the different, different scattering effects. So one possible scattering effect 
uh, is achieved when we add some losses, material losses to our system. And due, due to adding this loss, we get one of the poles or uh, one of the zeros in the upper complex plane to the real frequency x. <clears throat> and in this regime, since this zero is located at the real frequency x, it will absorb all the energy that comes from, from external uh, monochromatic phase, right? Since it, this point lies at the real frequency x. <clears throat> Why it's important? Well, because uh, there are some important situations when we uh, would like to uh, absorb all the energy that comes to the system. For example, uh, so recently people uh, got very interested in these two-dimensional semiconductors, transition metal different genomics. They got very interesting uh, excitonic resonances. The point is that these materials are very, very thin, basically atomically thin. And due to this small uh, thickness, uh, this material doesn't interact with light strongly. So people suggested to use an uh, optical resonator, like shown here, this is a, some sort of photonic crystal. This photonic crystal gets a resonance, and this resonance can be designed by arranging this old basically the periodicity of the structure to, uh, to achieve unitary uh, absorption uh, and zero, zero in reflection. So for example, uh, this bl uh, blue curve here demonstrates the absorption in the uh, TMDC material. So it's very, very small, right, at the exotonic resonance. But then you can, you design the structure, you basically make this uh, things here equal. At resonance, you get rid of this part. And when this delta and gamma equal, which are basically the <clears throat> um, coupling to the light, you basically radiation uh, loss and material loss in your system, you, you design these two factors due to the resonator and you get uh, full absorption in your system. So uh, because of this resonator, you couple all your light to the very thin, uh, atomically thin uh, layer of semiconductor. So this boosts the efficiency of the systems and uh, uh, the system works nicely. Well, <clears throat> this is, uh, that was about one port system, right? What if I have two port system, like a complete resonator? In this case, I have to excite my structure from both ports uh coherently by coherent ways <clears throat> and in this case this system when i achieve this point here this zero at the real frequency x this is called coherent perfect absorption why so because <clears throat> if i have this two port system i design my signal and probe or controlling beam uh their amplitudes and phase so that the all energy gets absorbed within this resonator here and then nice point is that when I change, for example, a phase of one of these phase, for example, the control beam, uh, I change the amount of energy that absorbed within this resonator. So I can control the amount of sort to absorb or uh, release from this resonator by coherent, coherent uh, excitation from two sides. Yeah, and this is how it works exactly at the CPA uh, coherent absorption regime wave. Waves just come. This blue uh, wavy uh, uh, curve is demonstrates the wave coming from both sides, but the red one is the output uh, out field, so it's zero. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and uh, this effect uh, has been uh, realized, of course, and uh, currently being used in many optical areas. But we also demonstrated that this um, effect can be used, for example, in microwaves. Uh, for example, in this uh, quite a paper recently, we have shown that if you have a transmitter, this transmitter radiates some energy, right? And we have the receiving antenna, like in your cell phone. And usually this cell phone antenna is very mismatched because of the size of the antenna. So the point is that you can excite your receiving antenna receiving antenna, it receives energy, you can excite your receiving antenna, and due to this uh, coherent excitation of your receiving antenna, 
U1 antenna starts absorbing uh, more energy from uh, from surrounding area. And the same we also realize for wireless power transfer. When you charge your devices, it's much more efficient and effectively uh, using this using this approach. So the next virtual uh, next uh, anomaly in light scattering is realized when you take a system with zero in the upper complex plane. And the, in our recent works, we have shown that you instead of adding loss to the system and making it absorbing and uh, lossy, right? Uh, we we can avoid that by tailoring the excitation in time, right? So this point is located in the upper upper complex plane. That means that if I tailor my excitation, so it is exponentially growing in time, I excite this bubble resonator from both sides by two exponentially growing signals. We can excite this point in the upper complex plane, and all energy <clears throat> gets stored within this resonator. It's not absorbed, but it can it gets stored within this resonator without any uh, without any leakage. So I've got, I guess, a question from the chat. Uh, thanks for the okay. <clears throat> Um, yeah, <clears throat> uh, so this slide demonstrates how the thing works. So we, here we have the resonator in the middle and two uh, exponentially growing signals coming from left and right. And uh, so you see that no transmission, no reflection from the structure and all energy, all field gets trapped within this Within this resonator, Just and then I stop. Excuse me. No, no, no. I'm actually oh, I'm using this. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and at some point I stop my exponential growing of the fields, right? And uh, after this point, all the energy gets released from the from the from the, from the resonator. But during this uh, excitation, the system looks like perfectly absorbing without any. Uh, waves that come out from from this resonator. We have generalized this idea to two-dimensional systems, three-dimensional systems. So basically, any way, uh, in any situation when you need to localize lights in a, uh, very small dimensions, you can use this effect, and it works perfectly. I mean, of course, in optics, it's very difficult to uh, tailor such an exponentially fun, uh, exponentially growing signal, but uh, still possible. And uh, yeah, and we also shown that uh, at microwaves, if you consider such a uh, rectangular waveguide with a uh, small cavity in the end, you can still treat this cavity as a resonator with its O and zero. You can build uh, the excitation signal and excite this, uh, this cavity at the end. Well, basically, all the energy that you send to the waveguide get stored within this very narrow, very small uh, cavity. This idea, uh, this approach was recently realized in uh, uh, by like, uh, our friends uh, in this science advances paper in, in, the, in the acoustical uh, uh, domain, right? Uh, so here uh, in the middle, this is the acoustical, Resonator. These two waveguides used to excite this resonator, and this group used the uh, opta vibrometer to to detect the optical with the electromagnetic, um, basic, basically not electromagnetic, the acoustical energy in this in this cavity. So <clears throat> that was about virtual perfect absorption when the uh, waves. Uh, grow exponentially, and the thing looks like uh, the things look like the the system absorb absorbs all the energy. And at the same time, if I consider the exponentially decaying signals, another possible effect. I mean, another effect is possible. This is called virtual gain effect. So the idea here is also like simple. So let's consider a resonator with some cavity mode. And uh, the point is that if your field uh, decays faster 
then the cavity decays, right? Your incoming field becomes larger effectively than the outgoing field. So the system works effectively works as a uh, as a gain system. And we, in our recent paper in Optica, we have shown that we can use this uh, virtual gain effect to achieve some interesting uh, mechanical uh, effect, basically this optical cooling force. And we uh, using this exponential decay field to uh, basically to pull some objects, for example. Yeah, this is a theoretical work, but uh, we plan to realize this in, in acoustics as well. Another possible idea, another possible effect uh, is achieved when we consider a particle, like small dielectric particle. And uh, for this particle, you can still, uh, you can calculate, for example, the uh, scattering intersection. And this scattering intersection is also a complex valid function. You can continue this function to the complex plane and calculate the, for example, forward scattering efficiency, right? And this forward scattering efficiency gets its own poles and zeros. And in this work in uh, Fizzeref letters published just maybe one week, one month ago, we have shown that we can achieve some interesting effects in scattering with these exponentially uh, growing and decaying signals. So another effect, when I consider a pole, right? That part was about the zeros. Now I'm bringing the pole to the to the story. So the pole, a pole responds to the uh, eigen mode of the system. And if I get, if I add gain, uh, like material gain to my system, I can push this pole to the uh, real frequency x. And when the pole gets to the real frequency x, the system turns into a laser. So basically, any type of laser. Uh, work like this. You get a pole, you get the F gain, you push the pole to the real X, uh, pole at the real X becomes a, a laser. Yeah, this is the characteristic kink uh, dependence of the input outputs, right, and the, and the narrowing of the, of the laser line. So basically this narrowing of the laser line due to uh, the fact that pole gets to the real frequency x and the pole is a, a delta function basically. So in theoretically you get delta function in, in, in response of your in response of your laser. Well, recently we demonstrated interesting thing that for example, if you take a dielectric nanoparticle like shown here in this uh, brownish color. Uh, this is, for example, could be a perovskite particle with a strong material gain. Then we surround this particle with so-called phase change material. So we can, uh, using, for example, a laser or electricity, we can basically change the crystalline crystallinity of this surrounding material. And when this uh, phase change material is the amorphous phase. Uh, the system works as a laser because of this uh, 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 semiconductor uh, core inside. So it works a laser, like I like a laser. But when I change the crystallinity of this uh, material to the crystalline phase, uh, the system shift uh, switches to the anapole state. Anapole. Uh, is basically a zero scattering, zero scattering. So this way I change my system from a laser. When I, for example, look in my in a microscope, right? Uh, the system, the system looks very bright. It emits a lot. But then I change the crystallinity of the system and it becomes anapole, which is invisible. So my particle becomes invisible. So in one single system, you can uh, like uh, flip your uh, system from uh, from a laser to anapole. Uh, well, it's still a theory, but we plan to realize this with the um, perovskite particles also. Alex, yes. So you, you said you gave us the notion that you move uh, the, the 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 pole to the real axis, and that's how you get it into laser. Yes. So this. Well, then this anapole corresponds to what kind of movement in the phase? Okay. 
Yeah, and this anaphold corresponds to basically this zero in scattering. Okay. Yeah. So when you change the crystallinity from amorphous, in amorphous, you get this pole in the real X. When you change the crystallinity to crystalline phase, you get zero from upper complex plane to the real X. So you can uh, play around with these false zeros. So, of course, more interesting effects, even more interesting effects will be realized when you bring several poles to the picture, right? And uh, each of these poles radiate light, they, they scatter, and this scattering can uh, uh, interfere constructively or destructively. And uh, this idea basically has been used for many years. Uh, uh, for many works here, I put just two of like our recent works. In this work, we have realized optical switch, basically optical optical transistor. When the in the weak light, the particles scatter symmetrically forward backward. But when we excite the particle with some second pulse, we generate some electron hole plasma in the particle. This electron hole plasma <coughs> changes the positions of the poles. And they in destructively interfere in the backward direction, and you get a uh, strong forward direction optical transistor. Of course, it's not scalable, so you cannot use this for optical computers, etc. But it still works as a speech. And a similar idea was realized in this paper uh, with uh, phase change materials. And maybe even more interesting work published very recently in uh, Nature Communications. This year uh, was about a meta surface with its own resonance, basically a pole, right? And this meta surface couples to the uh, phase change material here, and then using electrical bias, electrical current, we change the phase of the uh, GST material, phase change material from amorphous to crystalline. And we have achieved interesting effect. We have achieved the uh, the tun strong tunability, basically the change uh, of this system from non-scattering regime when all energy gets absorbed. So this is basically perfect absorber to to the almost perfect reflector, like a mirror uh, in in another phase in the in the amorphous phase. So yeah, and uh, this works pretty. Uh, I I don't remember the, the the times, but this change works pretty pretty fast, mill, millisecond uh, time scale. Yet another interesting scattering effect is possible when you get zero and pole, and bring them together to the same point at the uh, oh well uh, real frequency x. So in this regime, this scattering regime is called bound state in the continuum. So it's it's possible in the uh, system with no loss in the passive system. And uh, the easiest way to achieve this bound state, of course, uh, would be to take uh, many, many dipoles, like shown here, this hedgehog-like structure. So each a red arrow corresponds to a small dipole, and these small dipoles are arranged like a circle around this uh, around this, uh, this sphere, right? And we know that dipoles don't radiate along its axis, right? And uh, due to the symmetry of the structure, if you would ever excite these distributions of dipoles, uh, this structure would never radiate. And in fact, this was one of the first. Uh, explanations why the atom doesn't collapse in quantum mechanics. Before quantum mechanics, people thought that maybe some sort of the electron distribution like this around the atom uh, allows to an uh, atom like live forever right? without, without the collapse. I guess that was <coughs> Zamerfield theory. I'm not sure. Another approach to the bound state in the continuum is actually instead of this spherical um, uh, symmetry, uh, arrange these dipoles in a periodic structure like this. 
And assuming that the structure is infinitely large, uh, if you excite these dipoles like oscillating up and down in place, all the structure, uh, this structure wouldn't radiate again. Uh, and this is called bound state in the KQ in the gamma point, right? Because in the gamma point, your dipoles oscillate up and down in, in phase. And of course, in reality, you cannot realize the infinite structure is not possible. <coughs> so in a lab, it always looks like this, such a meta surface composed of uh, such a resonators here. And uh, what people do, they introduce a small uh, asymmetry by making these uh, little cuts there uh, to open up this bound state in the continuum. Right. Otherwise, without this asymmetry, you wouldn't absorb this point in, in, in scattering. So we need some slight uh, asymmetry in your system to open up the bound state in the continuum. <clears throat> In our recent work, we have uh, demonstrated another idea. So, uh, so basically, here you should look at this uh, panel C. So this is a uh, perfect electric conductor walls, like a microwave waveguide <coughs> made of a good metal, right? And perfect electric conductor works as a works as a mirror. So we suggested to put just one particle inside this, uh, between these mirrors, right? And uh, uh, what happens is that this resonator gets reflected, self-reflected many, many times from the mirrors. And uh, this resonator basically sees the infinite uh, array of itself, basically around. If you ever, uh, uh, like stand between two mirrors, right? You would see an infinite uh, area, like an uh, uh, infinite array of yourself in, in the reflections. <clears throat> so it's the same, the same happens here. So this way you get a virtual periodic structure, virtual periodic structure, let's say this way. And then the point is that this structure gets bound state in the continuum. And then in order to open up this bound state in the continuum, you need to bring some asymmetry here. So this is the experiment. We took the microwave waveguide, put this aluminum resonator uh, between these uh, mirrors, right? And uh, put a small, small little drop of water in such a, in such a small uh, well, container, right? It was like around 500, 100 microliters very small drop of water. And this small drop of water is enough to break the symmetry in the system. <clears throat> so you don't, the resonator don't see the perfectly periodic structure anymore. It's, it sees the broken structure in, in, the, in the reflection. And uh, <clears throat> the point is that a water is a very nice uh, subject, right? You can conduct some, uh, uh, chemical reactions, biological reactions in this drop of water. So we, what we done, what we done, we put a small grain of salt in a, such a water, and we result in time domain. We result the process of dissociation of this grain of salt in this very small drop of water. And uh, so this paper published also pretty recently. Also, oh, this is the wrong wrong reference. So this paper published in this year. And after that, some people from chemistry came to us and said that, oh, this is a very good system for some chemical characterization because uh, the current existing systems, they require a lot, a lot, large amount of material. So in this, in this system, you can do the same with a very small amount. So it's very uh, useful work, I, I guess, I hope. So, <clears throat> Uh, from the theoretical point of view, when you consider the interaction of two poles, like this uh, red one and grayish one, there are two possible regimes. The weak coupling, when they interact weakly, right? And strong coupling, when you increase the uh, coupling between the poles, you bring them together. And at some point, they start repulsing. So they basically repulse each other and uh, gets avoid cross. 
So this modes, this avoid cross modes called hybrid modes, and uh, <clears throat> and this regime is called strong coupling, <clears throat> right? And in this regime, you get <clears throat> these Rabi oscillations between hybrid modes and uh, nice physics there, which is very important for quantum optics, for example, because <clears throat> uh, if you consider, for example, one of the poles to be material resonance, like excitonic resonance in a semiconductor, in this second pole would be optical uh, resonance, optical mode of the cavity. Then this hybrid mode, hybridization means that you don't have any more matter and light, you get matter and light couple, hybridized. You cannot distinguish matter and light anymore because of the Arabic speaking. And uh, in this area, yeah, we have uh, we have done a lot of works like this when the uh, not not me personally, right? The experimentalists they took the uh, transition metal diffusionites of different kind. These materials get the exotonic, strong exotonic resonance, and uh, the, you can consider this resonance as one of the poles, material resonance. Uh, then you take the optical resonator like plasmonic nano antenna, and uh, this nano antenna has its own resonance. Usually, the quality factor of this uh, resonance is lower, so the pole is like <clears throat> uh, further from the real frequency x. You can couple them, for example, weekly, and you do so, you get this uh, final resonance in the in the scattering spectrum. People like this uh, asymmetric final resonances because effectively they become narrower because of the asymmetry, and this asymmetry helps you to do some sort of sensing and uh, nonlinear photonics as well. So uh, this type of works, and of course, strong coupling when, when you get two poles, one of poles is the material resonance, you hybridize them, and can you achieve some nice strong coupling regime with strong Rabi oscillations. Again, very interesting for, for quantum optics, for example, because uh, as you probably aware, Photons don't interact, right? When you like, when I use this light pointer, it doesn't. These photons don't scatter from from the light out uh, around. Uh, so photons, being bosons, they don't interact. But when you couple this photon to a matter resonance, like exciton, you get this hybrid regime, polaritons. They call polaritons, and these polaritons became very very nonlinear. So you can use this for Nonlinear optics. Um, so the last effect uh, I want to discuss today, I've got just maybe yeah, 15 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> when you take two poles, so I, I, at the previous slide I said that they repulse the, uh, each other, but this is not always the case. Sometimes <clears throat> the poles actually coalesce. They coalesce into one single uh, point like polarity. And this point like polarity is called exceptional point. So, two poles coalesce. Usually, uh, it happens at the real frequency x. In this regime, the system becomes like this regime becomes exceptional point. And, and if you increase the coupling between the poles, they still avoid cross and you get strong coupling. Uh, <clears throat> so as I said, in the real frequency and the real frequency x, it can happen only if you balance your loss in your system with the right amount of gain, right? You get loss and gain like system like this, a dimer uh, with some coupling in kappa here, the loss equal to the gain. So if you apply the uh, special inversion symmetry, right? You can gain the loss, and then time reversal symmetry. Time reversal means you uh, change gain by loss and vice versa. So you get exactly the same. So this system is uh, perfectly pt symmetric. And in this pt symmetric case, you get this exceptional point when two poles coalesce at the real frequency x. And people really like this regime because uh, it is. I mean, today it's used in like many works uh, like this one, but this one is already kind of outdated. People realize uh, many things. Uh, 
uh, these exceptional points are the center. So this uh, point here is very fragile. So any change in the materials in the um, surrounding of these resonators uh, making this exceptional point, this uh, combined pole one, pole two, uh, split again. And you immediately see this, this change in your optical um, spectra, right? Spectra. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> of course, this can happen not only at the real frequency X in the passive system without any gain, right? Gain is something that is very, like, sometimes difficult to achieve, difficult to bring to the system. <clears throat> so you still can achieve exceptional point, but in the lower complex plane. You take one pole from the lower plane, second pole, bring them together, and sometimes they coalesce. And this coalescence makes, realizes this complex exceptional point, complex exceptional point. And then our also recent physical letters paper, we have shown that uh, these complex exceptional points, they actually still can be used for, for the same reasons are like for the same applications like uh, conventional exceptional points, provided that you use uh, exponentially decaying signal. So here again, you can reach this com uh, complex exceptional point by using the uh, complex excitation, and then use this for sensing, etc., without any gain. So this system doesn't require any gain. Uh, yeah. And final final slide for the demonstrate conveying the point that uh, basically why sometimes poles get avoid cross, sometimes they tie less, right? What, what's going on here? So the point is that, <clears throat> so here, this panel on the, on the left shows the real part of the scattering matrix in the complex plane. So this is how it looks in a typical uh, calculation, right? So this uh, blue-ish spot corresponds to the zero, and the yellow one uh, corresponds to the, to the pole. And this zero here is the real frequency x, right? So if you plot the phase of this picture here, or, or here shown here on the on the right side, you observe the vortexes, the two vortexes uh, of these zeros and poles. So basically, we call this a winding number, right? And this is one of the topological topological charges, you can say. And in fact, this topological charges of the system of this particular system is uh, minus one of the zero and plus one of the pole. So their topological charges are equal but opposite sign. So you can bring them together; they can coalesce and can realize exceptional point, for example. But in other systems, in other situations, uh, these Charges are of opposite sign or opposite uh, value. They don't coalesce because of this topology. And instead of exceptional point, you get avoid crossing and strong coupling. Yeah, so basically, a few uh, take home points. Photonics revolutionizes our technology. Tailoring and matter structures, symmetry and composition enables unusual scattering effects. And uh, novel scattering effects and advanced materials enable unprecedented control of light matter interactions. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, mic is on. All right, so we have time for questions. Please go ahead. For the salt experiment, uh -huh. uh, what was the explanation for the Changing the like the chemical reaction. Is it strong coupling? So now this is the bound state in the continuum. So without water and without salt in this in this container, the system is perfectly symmetric. And this in this perfectly symmetric system, you don't absorb the resonance here. So um so this pink ish curve here almost corresponds to low water in the system. So just if you remove the water, you would get the plane line here. So no resonance. Uh, 
Yeah, but then if you add the water, you open up this res resonance, right? And uh, this position and the uh, the leads of this uh, resonant line in, in, in reflection depends on the material, basically, this, this water. And uh, when the salinity of the water increases, uh, this line gets shifted. And we measure the shift of this line, and this way we resolve the the, the percentage of the crystallinity of the of the water. This is just one example. Of course, I mean, using water, you can do many other experiments. Uh, yeah, this was just a proof of concept of this of this simple technology. So basically, what you need just a rectangular waveguide in this and drop of water. I guess all of you have some drops, drops of water. Yeah, and you can, you can do this. Pretty good. Uh, we have some ideas with blood, and etc. And the system is very sensitive. And the sensitivity is because of the high quality factor of this resonance, right? Thank you. Other questions? Sean? Um, so if you're going to transition from an avoided crossing to exceptional point system, what do you see in the phase? The winding number is at first trivial, right? And then the winding number is non-trivial. How does that happen? So my understanding is the uh, question about how this work, right? How, what happens to the winding number? Right. Well, I'm, I'm wondering about a system like, let's say we had a system where we can control some parameter mm -hmm. and it's going to switch between an avoided crossing system and an exceptional point system. Mm -hmm. so first one, mm -hmm. it should have trivial winding numbers, right? Second one, non-trivial. So what's the what's the picture? Are these like are these branching out and then suddenly connecting? Or what, what kind of thing do you see happening in the phase space? Yeah, so my understanding is that um when we right so, so to realize this system, this exceptional point, we need uh the same winding number, but of opposite side to merge them. To, to coalesce them in the exceptional point. Uh, in contrast to this situation, when we have some pole and zero, and they avoid cross, right, without formation this exceptional point. Uh, so my understanding is that in this case, the pole and zero, the, these two poles, they have, initially they have different topological charge, and when they form hybrid modes, they still have different, I mean, these hybrid modes still have different topological charge, but I never checked that. So it's very interesting point to check. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? So maybe I'll ask a similar question. So can, can you give a sense, so, so if once you form the exceptional point, right, that's formed out of two, Mm -hmm. uh, poles of uh, the same in, in magnitude, the same winding. So let's say with one, mm -hmm. they coalesce, you have an exceptional point. Now, what is the remaining quality? So, for instance, but I can imagine, for instance, two points with a topological charge two coalescing or three or n. Mm -hmm. So, what is it? What is the property of the exceptional point that tells you how many windings were the what was the property of the exceptional point that tells you about the original topological charge that got canceled out. It disappears. It disappears, but so, so the perfect exceptional point, I guess. So the so the, the notion of whether you had charge one, two, or n mm -hmm. completely disappears once you have an exceptional point? Was there uh, is there uh, is there some still character of that exceptional point that would tell you what was the original topological charge. So there is another story behind here, be behind this picture. So this is the winding number, simple, simply because the field, the scattering uh, diverges or right, either to zero or to, to pole, it's basically um, uh, I mean, it's infinite, right? And around is either zero or infinite, you, of course, get this winding number. But there is another story behind this 
topo topology of exceptional points in the another uh, space, in the configuration space. So this is the frequency space, right? In the configuration space, you still have this exceptional point in the Riemann surface. And uh, there is a, an, another type of topology, uh, topology associated with exceptional point. Uh, so my understanding is yes, when you start from two poles with the same topology in the winding number topology, and they simply coalesce, they simply destroy themselves. It's like uh, hole and electron, right? They basically they destroy the charge or mm -hmm. of each other. The same happens here. Uh, I'm not sure if it is always like this, but thus far, this those system that we consider, yes. But I'm not sure if it's like general. Okay, thank you. Other questions? For the coherent perfect absorber that uh -huh. you presented at the beginning, uh, the effects. Do they depend on the relative amplitude of the field, or so in a sense they are like nonlinear? So if you would uh, keep one field stable and increase the other one, how's the response? Is it like linear response or? So the response. So for the coherent perfect absorption, uh, the response is here. So this is for the phase, but for the amplitude is pretty much the same. Uh, if you Make the system balance, right? It absorbs all the energy in this in this point. And then you change the phase of the control beam or amplitude, keeping the phase the same. Uh, you get pretty much the same, the same, the same picture. So it basically uh, sine uh, or sine square function. Um, yeah, and uh, in of course in this. In this regime of coherent perfect absorption, uh, the same story holds here. <clears throat> you either you can excite the system from both sides with the same rate, right? Uh, with the same slope, or you can change vary the 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 rate of the second beam and also control the amount of stored energy in the cavity. So this is the linear system. We also consider a nonlinear system when at some point, uh, your system becomes linear, right? And then this zero starts moving in the complex plane. Uh, pretty interesting story. Sometimes the zero can approach the real frequency x, so you kind of trap the field inside the resonator. Uh, yeah, but this is not like new. This is what people already uh, demonstrated for other systems, not, not with growing signals, but it's monochromatic, yeah. Um, and the, maybe the last point to mention here is that in the camp, in the in optics, it's very difficult to build this uh, exponentially growing signals, right? But for example, in microwaves, in radio waves, acoustics, any other types of waves, there are generators that generate these exponentially growing signals. And uh, today we explore how this exponentially growing signals to interact, for example, with uh, uh, super, uh, superconducting quantum bits, like qubits, right? And uh, be storing the energy there, control the quantum state with this, this uh, <clears throat> complex, complex um, excitations. So it's kind of a new way to look at the, uh, look at this system and a lot of new, and interesting th things happen in the complex plane. Uh, maybe, yes, time for maybe last question. Uh, yes, you have described the resume gas matrix, uh, thermal resonance. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm asking the question if uh, it's possible to have a thermal resonance without uh, the imaginary part that the losses, uh, just, uh, just a phenomenon of interference <laughs> without any loss, or it is always required to have a loss. Yeah, so the question is about final resonance. And I said that final resonance is uh, built of two uh, poles, two modes, like here. And the question is, can it be without loss? My understanding is not, is not possible. So there are two ways to look at the final resonance. 
One is completely quantum when, like the atom, uh, gets either transition to the higher excitation level, right, or to the continuum. Uh, and uh, you have this quantum interference of this transition and continuum. So continuum is loss. So you have this loss. And of course, this quantum transition also gets some uh, some uh, beats, right? So some loss. So even in this quantum picture, quantum resonance is intrinsically um, the manifestation of non hermeticity TCT, <laughs> right? An optical way to look at the final resonance is to consider two modes: one with like bright mode, another one dark mode, and you get this asymmetric final resonance in the result of their interference. Interference means they are not orthogonal, not orthogonality means they are not Hermitian. Non Hermitian means presence of loss. So yeah, I guess so is like this. Okay, I think uh, with that, maybe it's time to conclude. So let's thank, thank you. Alex and Lee.